Welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, start by speaking very slowly and uh, introduce everyone as gradually a few more people join us. Um, I'm Caroline, I'm from the um, National Heritage Science Forum. Um, welcome to this first in a series of four online events, um, which is a joint endeavour by uh, the Icon Heritage Science Group and uh, the National Heritage Science Forum. Um, I'm sure everyone is very familiar with online meetings by now, um, but as I've mentioned, just going to say a couple of words of introduction and housekeeping uh, before handing over to my colleague Anne Tanas um, from the Icon Heritage Science Group, uh, who's going to chair the, this afternoon's meeting. So in terms of the meeting, uh, we're in meeting mode rather than webinar mode. So if you could please just keep an eye on your camera and microphone um, and make sure that those are uh, turned off unless you're actually sort of asking a question or speaking. Um, and secondly, um, as I'm sure you will have been alerted as you joined the meeting, we are recording this session um, and we hope to make it available um, afterwards on YouTube. So please as well. Um, turning to the seminar itself, we've had a huge response in terms of registrations, which we're absolutely delighted about. So welcome everybody. Um, the National Heritage Science Forum is a grouping of organisations in the UK, and we work together to facilitate collaboration and knowledge, knowledge exchange, um, and to enhance the contribution that heritage science makes to society. Um, and we work mainly through our membership, um, on three strands of activity. And this seminar series is part of the work that we do to um, help to build a strong and diverse heritage science community with greater awareness of the field um, and increased opportunities for participation. Um, and these research sharing seminars originated for, from some workshops that uh, we held jointly with the Icon Heritage Science Group back in March of last year, um, in which we asked students and early career researchers how we could best support their sort of networking and development opportunities in the field. Uh, so I'm really excited about the programme ahead, um, and particularly that this first session, very pleased to welcome our speakers who you can see um, on screen here. We have Abed Haddad. Hello, Abed. Oops, sorry, drinking, caught you at a bad moment. <laughs> Um, and Tanas Malinas, who has, um, who's not only speaking, but also chairing. So uh, thank you, Antanas, and Paola Ricciardi as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Antanas um, for him to start today's session. Thanks, Antanas. Hi, all. Thank you all for coming. Um, we envisage this session as something very open. Um, uh, very sort of freestyle where you get to not just listen, meet your fellow heritage science researchers, both uh, senior and emerging, but also ask them all sorts of questions, listen to their talks and discuss amongst themselves. So we'll start with Abed, who is a newly promoted uh, assistant conservation scientist at the Mo Museum of Modern Art in New York. So congratulations to him for that. Um, and he'll speak to us about uh, Giorgio de Chirico as the foundations of a great metaphysical style and having Giorgio de Chirico's early ballet. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Perfect. So let me just share my screen very quickly. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the well wishes. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Abed Haddad and I am joining you today from the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which is situated on the unceded lands of the Manasila Lenape tribe. I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Manasila Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. MoMA also acknowledges that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples including those whose land this institution is located. And with that, um, I will start my presentation on uh, Giorgio de Chirico's early palette, in particular his metaphysical style. This research uh, was done in collaboration with the Manil Collection in Houston, 
um, as well as here at the Museum of Modern Art. So George de Chirico is one of the most enigmatic figures of the 20th century. His metaphysical paintings preceded and inspired the dreamlike scenes of the surrealist painters of the 1920s. And his output between the years of 1909 and 1919 was considered by many to be the apex of his career. Works from this time display his distinctive visual vocabulary of empty piazzas, colonnaded buildings, mannequins, and strangely juxtaposed everyday objects. But at the beginning of the 1920s, the Chirico abandoned his metaphysical style for a more classical one. Um, so, uh, you know, those works proved to be difficult to exhibit and sell, and with the newfound popularity of surrealism, the Chirico's metaphysical works far surpassed um, in popularity those of his new style. And so as collectors desired, uh, as the collectors desire outpaced availability, copies or forgeries of the Chirico's metaphysical works began to appear on the market. And further confusion was created by de Chirico himself. So in the 1920s, while continuing to develop his neo-baroque style, he developed, I'm um, sorry, he began to revisit his meta, uh, metaphysical motifs. And the practice started as a way to satisfy the demands of his inner circle, but then continued to do so for financial reasons. So detangling authentic metaphysical works by de Kierko from forgery and very falsy, which what we call those backdated works by de Kierko, very from true and falsy from false, um, we wanted to analyze and better understand his palette to help with any kind of um, authentication that might be needed for his metaphysical works. So um, the Kiriko was kind of a prolific writer. And in the absence of identifiably anachronistic materials, insights in the into the authenticity of the works uh, could be garnered by comparing analytical results to de Chirico's published accounts of his materials and processes. So you can see that he published between 1928 and 1962, several sources um, where he lists the pigments that he uses. So you can see there's a huge variety of both inorganic and organic pigments. Some are easier to identify like zinc white or lead white, but others have you know, uncommon or colloquial names like mineral blue or brilliant yellow. Um, so this kind of served as a springboard for um, comparing our analytical results to what he had described in his writing. Um, we were very lucky to be able to analyze 11 metaphysical works that have been, um, that are you know, authentic and are documented as so. But the Menil also recently uncovered two Vera Falsi works in their collection, those being the last two, Melancholia and Hector and Andromache. Both were dated to 1916 and the second to 1918, but have been since uh, um, been dated to the 1940s based on the identification of an organic yellow um, in the palette, which was not available until the 1940s. So you can see that some works that have been previously identified and certified as authentic de Chiricos from his metaphysical period are now even in museum collections being uncovered as Vera Falsi. <clears throat> so while we at MoMA were not able to sample any of our paintings because they're relatively pristine and there was no sampling available on the tacking edge, the Manil collection were lucky to be able to sample both scrapings and cross sections for ground analysis. So for the grounds and the technique of painting, which was published in 1962, the Kiriko describes how to prepare and apply a ground layer for oil painting. He specifically mentions the use of zinc white, but indicates that lead white can also be used. And noting that it's also advisable to add small amounts of black or red pigment to tone the ground because quote, it is not easy to paint on an absolutely white surface, end quote. So you can see cross sections from the six Camille paintings. The first four are authentic metaphysical works, and the last two are the Vera Falsi. Um, show that this does not really correspond to his writings. This is from 1962, so it's many decades after the creation of these works. So it's possible that he's changed his techniques or was maybe pontificating rather than applying these techniques himself. So 
So none of the Menil works show pigmented grounds or multiple layers. An examination of the cross section samples under UV gives no evidence of the presence of a varnish layer between the ground and the surface plane, something that he also indicated in his writing. So now we're going to get into the palette. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through all the pigments we've identified in the palette and kind of give a little bit of information on how he used these colors. You know, this kind of technical study helps us better understand how he used these colorants in creating his metaphysical motifs and metaphysical compositions in hopes of kind of uh, elucidating any issues that might come in the future in terms of authenticating some of the metaphysical works made by de Kierke. So in his writing, he describes lead white as the most perfect of all whites, but says that zinc white is his preferred pigment as it, quote, does not alter the colors with which it is mixed. Despite the statement, the Kiriko appears to have used zinc white exclusively in only of the two paintings analyzed, the Vera Falsi, actually, um, which is really interesting to know that he might have abandoned the use of lead white later in his career, which could be an interesting marker for identifying you know, uh, Vera Falsi or forgeries from authentic metaphysical works. The Kiriko also appeared to be judicious in his choice of whites, and patterns emerged when comparing the localization of lead and zinc across all 11 metaphysical works. So architectural and cultural forms are usually painted with lead white, either thickly, like in the Song of Love, you can see here in the sculpture of Apollo, or thinly on top of a ground, like in the piazza here of the um, Enigma of a Day. Whereas the zinc white, was used in other forms to lighten the colors of the palette. So you can see here, for example, he lightened this red right here using zinc white, but also used zinc white for less sculptural or textural motifs like the thread here. I'm gonna turn on my pointer, that will be helpful. Um, but he, as I mentioned, he also only used zinc white in the Vera Falsi. So you can see here this Vera Falsi of Hector Andromache the mannequins are painted exclusively in zinc white with no presence of lead white. So for the blacks, the Akirko listed ivory black or bone black along with vine black among his preferred pigments. Uh, but he also used, he also suggested the use of crushed charcoal. So in the work analyzed, he appears to have used at least two different black pigments, bone black or ivory black, which contains hydroxyapatite. And that was kind of the marker for us, calcium and phosphorus in the SRF spectra, but also magnetite or the synthetic Mars black, which is a synthetic iron oxide. So while bone black appears to be his preferred pigment used in most of the metaphysical works, magnetite appears to have been used in two paintings, uh, in particular here, biscuits, where the black was used in the background. If the pointer makes me not, here we go. Okay. So for the browns, the Kiriko listed a variety of natural brown pigments, including burnt sienna, burnt and raw umber, and Van Dyke brown. Um, brown pigments are most often iron oxide species of varying composition, which range in tonality depending on calcination. And Van Dyke Brown and Castle Earth are humic earth rich in organic materials, which can be difficult to identify exclusively with something like XRF. However, some combination of elemental markers and the color uh, of the paint applied can help suggest the type of brown used. So for example, iron-based browns are all characterized by high levels of iron, with some natural earth pigments having trace amounts of elements such as aluminum, silicon, potassium, and titanium. So ochres tend to be very rich in those materials. So you can see here, for example, a brown ochre was used in this great metaphysical interior painting um, in the pedestal or base. However, umber is unique in the browns is that it contains five to 20% of manganese oxides and hydroxides. And the presence of manganese in an XRF spectrum can help us pinpoint the use of umber, for example, here in this bolster in biscuits. For the reds, the Kiriko listed four red pigments, Morlone Earth, Red Earth, Vermilion, and Carmine Lake. Morlone Earth being a type of red ochre, 
um, can be difficult to distinguish from other kinds of red ochres, like a Venetian red, for example. They're all very similar in composition. They just have very uh, different ways of preparation. XRF identification of red ochre is less straightforward depend because of the high, you know, you have to depend on the high levels of iron, quite often accompanied with other trace amount elements like aluminum, silicon, potassium, and titanium. But the presence of those in red areas with the absence of other red colorants, like vermilion, for example, identified by the presence of mercury, tells us that there is possibly a use of red ochre. So for example, here in the astronomer, the red terracotta um, or um, the red terracotta roofs are done in red ochre. Whereas vermilion was, is identified across all of the metaphysical works and the Verifalsi, sorry, but not in the two Verifalsi, to create red and orange tones. So vermilion can be an interesting marker again, much like the absence of lead white, to distinguish between authentic um, metaphysical works from the early teens um, and those that were done by forgers or later backdated by the Kirko himself. So vermilion was used to kind of create orange tones, like the famous glove in the Song of Love, but also to create deep reds like in the cylinder right here in the faithful servitor. For the yellows, uh, PXRF suggests the presence of three yellows in the Kyrgyz metaphysical paintings. Those are yellow ochre, um, Naples yellow, and chrome yellow, all of which are listed in his documentation or writing. So the identification of yellow ochre, again, is based on the detection of high levels of iron, accompanied by weaker signals with trace amounts of elements like aluminum, silicon, potassium, and titanium in yellow areas. And yellow ochre is a common pigment in the Kirikos work analyzed here, and it was universally used to depict all of the planks and solid yellow foregrounds, like in the duo or in the enigma of a day. And mixed with other colors, notably earth, other earth pigments like brown, to tone um, grays and shadows like the ones created by arches here in the enigma of a day. Chrome yellow, on the other hand, was used nearly pure in all of the yellow toys and tchotchkes across the 13 works, such as the evil genius right here, or toys, because these are just very bright chrome yellow. The Kirka also accentuated other colors with chrome yellow quite liberally, like the ball here in evil genius. You can see there's a little sliver of yellow, and that was done in chrome yellow as well. Biscuits contains cadmium yellow, but not pigment yellow four, used to depict this very small sponge right here. But in the Veripalsi paintings, like Hector and Andromache or Melancholia here, cadmium yellow was found in combination with pigment yellow four, which was used, the organic was used quite regularly to tone cadmium yellow or to use less cadmium yellow in artist paint formulations. So um, it's very likely that this is a paint that um, the Kiriko had picked up and used to depict the sky here, for example, in Melancholia. Naples yellow, on the other hand, was only in two paintings from 1915, um, the duo and Amusements of a Young Girl. And you can see, interestingly, he used that Naples yellow to create this very pale yellow horizon in the sky. So similar use for this particular pigment. And Naples yellow is um, very easy to identify with XRF because antimony occurs very rarely in any other pigment, especially yellow. For the greens, the Kiriko lists three green pigments in his treatise, emerald green, veronese green, and green earth. And in the painting analyzed here, only a chromium-based greens, only chromium-based greens, sorry, and copper acetyl arsenite were identified. So a chromium-based green was used selectively to create dark greens with the foliage in the great metaphysical interior painting right here. Um, but on the other hand, a green shrub in the duo contains a mixture of Prussian blue and chrome yellow, which was sold commercially as chrome green, which can be kind of a confusing between the chrome green and the chromium oxide green. On the other hand, copper acetyl arsenite green, or what we know as emerald green, 
was used regularly in most of the painting and modeling of forms such as balls and toys and volumetric shapes. So you can see here the use of green in this particular ball in the Song of Love, and again, highlighted with chrome yellow, very similar to the evil genius. Um, but care and interpretation in his writing needs to be taken here as Veronese green and emerald green are somewhat confusing terms. Copper acido arsenite was marketed in England under the name emerald green. But in France, that name was already in use to describe Viridian. So copper acetyl arsenite was sold as Veronese green instead, which is what he mentions in his writing. And finally, for the blues, the Kirko lists a few blues. Some are clearly identifiable, like Prussian blue or ultramarine. Others are less so, such as mineral blue or, um, which, and, or cerulean blue, which can denote, denote cobalt stannate or other mixtures that produce a cerulean hue. So here, the predominant blue used by the Kirka across all time periods um, is Prussian blue. And it was found both in the Verifalci as well as the authentic metaphysical works. And while the blue box here in the Faithful Servitor um, appears very dark and nice and very uh, deep Prussian blue, the box in Biscuits actually contained both Prussian blue and cobalt stannate. So it's interesting to see him mixing these two blues to come with this um, much lighter hue. So in conclusion, this study sheds new lights um, on the pigments used by de Kierke during his metaphysical period. And to our knowledge, this is the first comprehensive study of metaphysical works um, by de Kierke to identify a common theme or palette. Um, to help with authentication of his early metaphysical works. And this approach complements our historical connoisseurship. You know, at the end of the day, at quantum based of science, this, this is what we do. We look at objects, but we also look to our history to kind of inform our findings. So this not only can serve as a reference point for, un, for works of uncertain origins, it helps us understand better the Kierkegaard's working process and kind of, you know, tease apart his writing um, a little bit more. So thank you for your attention, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. It's a fantastic talk, Ahmed. Thank you very much. Um, would, may, would maybe anyone have some questions for him? So many colors, <laughs> so little time. Yes, I, yes, so many colors, so little time. It, it, yeah. So if, if you, by the way, if you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, you can turn on video. I see a so, question. So yes. the question would be from Marco Colombo saying thanks for the talk you mentioned about brown ochre and umber however to my knowledge a separation between the two is quite difficult as umber has a high amount of manganese oxide but brown ochres consist of manganese oxide too yes i mean uh there definitely can be amounts of of manganese oxides or hydroxides and other brown ochres um however looking in the literature and research seems that there's consistently a high amount of manganese containing um, you know, trace materials like oxides and hydroxides in umber. And it, you know, that is used quite regularly as a marker to differentiate. But I do agree with you in that the iron oxides are very hard to tease apart, even with something like FGIR or Raman spectroscopy, because they do often contain you know, the same kind of crystal structures that might be difficult to analyze with these kind of spectroscopic materials, um, it's like the spectroscopic techniques, we would have to rely on something a bit different, like XPS, for example, or looking at oxidation states of these, of these iron containing um, pigments, but it, we had a hard time sampling. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're kind of relying on just general knowledge of the use of manganese. Thank you. Um... Well, just to keep, just to say, to keep track of the timing, we'll probably move on to the next talk, but we'll have ample time for discussions at the end of the session. We'll have about a half an hour's 
space to ask anything you want uh, to any of the speakers. Um, Shall I come in now, Dennis? Please do. <laughs> Hello, just Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm temporarily taking over the role of chair uh, just to introduce Antana so he doesn't have to introduce himself because he's our following speaker. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce him. Antanas Melinis is an archaeologist by training. He then did the MRS in Science and Engineering in Arts, Heritage and Archaeology, which is when we met in UCL some years ago and then continued with a PhD in the Institute of Archaeology on the topic of the, the, the degradation of historical glass. Uh, Antanas is, is an expert in the use of, of portable XRF in the analysis of glass. And in fact, everything I know about the topic I have learned from him because he is actually also a great teacher and very patient. Um, he's also a, a, the student representative in the heritage science group in the Institute of Conservation um, where he has held this position for close to two years now. Uh, over to you, Antanas. Thank you very much, Joseph. See, so. Just share. All right, can everyone see it well? Yes, we can. Right. All right, so let's kick off with something completely different from Abed's talk. Um, I would like to talk about something that's kept me busy for the last five few years uh, as a PhD student. Um, at UCL, um, it's it's a very uh, let's say experimental uh, study in trying to understand uh, how to store archaeological glass. Um, just unfortunately, uh, a few studies deal with uh, because the majority of the focus usually falls on on historical samples and archaeology is uh, contains so many variables. So. We decided to, to tackle this question. So uh, thank you again for coming here and for listening to me and I'll, I'll hope I'll run you through this, uh, this topic and I'll try to explain the processes as well as I can. Uh, let's see, so you know, although many of the glasses that we see in museum displays have retained much of their outward appearance or even structural integrity. Uh, the majority of archaeological glass uh, looks like all these. Um, so these are medir medieval and early modern samples from the storage of the Satomara County Museum in Romania. Uh, as you can see, most of these hardly look like us at all, um, except maybe by shape. And fortunately, this is the fate of many pieces currently held in the museum and private collections, including those of English heritage, which I'm partnered with, uh, just estimated to house as many as 250,000 glass objects, many of which are experiencing active corrosion. And therefore it's of utmost importance to find the optimum conditions to extend their longevity. So some glasses such as these Roman artifacts age better because of their higher chemical resilience um, and occasionally they almost look pristine, except for the very characteristic iridescent uh, patina, which contrasts starkly with most medieval European counterparts, for example, that feature heavy corrosion, despite having spent only a third of the time on the ground, so more or less compared to the Roman examples. So still, even they're not immune to the effects of gradual corrosion and having accustomed to their conditions on the ground, uh, it can be hard to bring them back and bring them into museum conditions. And the altered surfaces may slowly flake off either due to natural drying or excess humidity or physical disturbance. So this, this look, maybe it looks, looks a bit scary, but this is uh, it's simply a, a model of what happens when glass is exposed to uh, any um, any water, any humidity in the atmosphere or uh, is submerged, for example, or is buried underground where it has access to water. So uh, this is the classical 
called classical interdiffusion model, and it posits that the initial most common stage is the leaching of the alkali within the glass. So glass is usually made of uh, silica, some sort of alkali and alkaline earths. So for instance, silica, sodium, and calcium. So the sodium in this case would be uh, going out, sodium or potassium ions are preferentially removed and are simultaneously replaced with free hydrogen species from, from uh, the atmosphere or, or any aqueous solution. And the hydrated silica-rich film develops on the surface, where the extracted alkali subsequently deposit on the surface and attract even more moisture from the environment uh, where, where it can coalesce. Uh, and this causes a phenomenon known as weeping that is recognized by the characteristic droplets of alkaline solution on the exterior of the glasses and is the precursor to further degradation. And this dominates mostly in uh, acidic environments. Um, the other facet is the model of hydrolysis, which steps in when uh, the pH is strongly alkaline, which is not so common in, in uh, natural environments, for example, soils. So here the silica network itself is attacked and gradually dissolved. And you can see these pits, uh, which are most frequently caused by the, the, uh, the alkali that are previously mentioned that accumulate and accumulate and accumulate in uh, small clumps in the surface and just sort of uh, grind through that surface because of their highly alkaline uh, solution that they create with water from the atmosphere or the soil. And both of these processes can happen simultaneously with one or the other dominating on either side of the pH scale. And of course, it's not by no means ex exclusive and there's many other, uh, but in the interest of brevity, uh, uh, this is how you know, the general understanding of, of glass corrosion is. Um, so during the later stages of this, the glass can appear to take a hazy appearance such as this medieval cup uh, pictured on the left. And this is caused by thousands of tiny cracks that are formed within the hydrated glass layer as seen on the microscopic surface and the cross section photographs on top. And it is known as crizzling and using the word in a very narrow sense as just one of the series of stages that begin with glass weeping and, and with complete glass body collapse. And it's a very disfiguring process, as well as very damaging to physical integrity because it's extremely hard to conserve. And most of these um, hydrated crystal layers are already poorly adherent to the parent glass. And it's mostly their surface tension uh, that keeps them from separating. And crystalline further diminishes this effect uh, where the leach layer begins to gradually flake off. And this also permits ingress of moisture even deeper into the glass, creating a vicious cycle, uh, which generally terminates in the complete disintegration of the piece if unattended. Um, and we don't fully know what sets it off. Um, it's probably some sort of a um, physical uh, difference between the parent glass and the hydrated layer or within the hydrated layer itself, but some sort of internal stresses that causes it to collapse. Um, either where the, when the alkali are leached out to the degree where you know, the, the, um, the structure of the glass collapses on itself because of the voids, or when it swells because of the water entering its structure and again cracks up. So arguably the main factor governing glass deterioration post-excavation is the ambient humidity. And many scholars have tried to pinpoint the optimal range that would balance out leaching and drying in an effort to stall it um, with you know, just a few proposals list on the left. But even the deliquescence points of various salts that form on or within the glass have been put forward at this point as a reference because they would probably not be attracting moisture below their deliquescence values. Um, however, these must be reconsidered in face of newer evidence. So I've just quickly compiled a sample list of some studies, uh, reviewed for their recommendations, some taken you know, quite verbatim. So um, 
and, and most frequently related to historical glass that was never buried. Um, the ranges in blue signify unspecified values up to a certain RH, while the ranges in bright orange define stricter conditions for objects already undergoing active deterioration. And you can see they vary considerably and can understandably be quite broad because there's so many other factors at play. Um, but the more defined ranges usually center on around 35 to 50% range. Well, we need to know more. We will need to know which, uh, which sets of conditions should be balanced between um, an environment that's too humid, so it promotes leaching, and an environment that's too dry, so it promotes uh, drying of the hydrated layer and crizzling, uh, so we can uh, help out the conservators and English heritage and other collections around the world. So the research objectives for this are quite straightforward. I just want to explore the nature of the weathered layer and to reproduce it accurately, uh, understand the effects of different humidity levels on deterioration of the surface, test a myth known as acoustic emission as a way to detect crystalline in real time, and relate the obtained data to conservation practice. So we reproduced some glasses, uh, model glasses, uh, the, the compositions of which you can see on top. Um, first two were widely used by German researchers, and uh, they were chosen because it would allow for easy comparison with the results of their studies. Um, MI and 1.0, um, been they are meant to model the behavior of uh, medieval European glasses, uh, whereas the third one called IF. P12 uh, is a model glass based on the composition from a Roman uh, Iulia Felix shipwreck, uh, which is also a relatively unstable glass for its time by composition. Uh, they are made and blown into these rondelles that can be easily sliced up into squares for later testing. Uh, so one of the first goals was to create uh, whether layers in the model glass that would ideally be structurally and chemically similar to archaeological glass and preferably not crystal, so it could be induced later. And um, I've kickstarted with acid leaching, that is meant to be one of the fastest methods to accelerate corrosion. And indeed, it was very fast, so formic and hydrochloric acid solutions were sufficient to produce the layers in uh, just two hours. And formic acid layers were generally thicker despite its higher pH. Uh, here you can see the, uh, slight, the results of slightly longer exposure studies. Uh, so 2, 18, 48 hours uh, for different conditions in both of these glasses. Uh, you can see that on average, the, the rates are very high during the first few hours, but they taper down as time goes by, uh, likely slowed down by the decreasing proportion of alkali that can still be extracted from the glass surface. And here, the M1.0 glasses probably suffered the most damage because uh, they're less protected by their various admixtures, uh, such as iron, uh, alumina, phosphorus, and so on, that feature in the MI glass and increase the durability, the chemical durability of these models. Uh, additional tests for informic acid were done in Roman glass, but it's been seen even after one year at room temperature, they've had very little effect, which is very surprising, surprisingly resilient. They, they've made them. Um, more reliable acceleration method had to be found that would produce the results within a short time frame. And we took an idea from a study conducted almost 90 years ago reference to the bottom, uh, where chemist Maurice Guillaume filled laboratory vials with a saturated solution of sodium bicarbonate, otherwise known as baking soda. And he observed that the insides of the vials developed thick, uh, laminated corroded layers within weeks or months. And to my knowledge, uh, this was a similar technique of corrosion that would alkaline solutions uh, between pH of nine and eight hasn't been repeated in later read publications. So we decided to try it out. Um, so it's decided to conduct a series of small experiments using pieces from five by five to 30 by 30 millimeters. And in, in that pH 8.5 solution in airtight containers. And 
it was observed that the pieces, the size of the pieces had significant impact since the smaller flakes were ready for crystalline in atmospheric conditions after just you know, three, uh, three and a half hours, where the other ones required twice as much or up even up to 24 hours without cracking up. Um, following that, the glasses would crystal within a day or even as little as six hours as they dried. Um, again, the Roman glasses were just as resilient as they were in acid, uh, except for some of that uh, thick iridescent patina that Gio also described. Very quick picture, you can see the development of crystalline in sort of real time. Uh, you can see the cracks appearing in uh, uh, the M1.0 glass after eight hours. Um, you can see, so you can see the finer crystalline on, on glasses usually signifies more advanced crystalline. Uh, localized deterioration, where you can see within the same piece, you can have different patterns of extraction of minerals, so these black dots everywhere. Uh, which also result in different patterns of crystalline. And you can see fewer cracks where there was fewer uh, mineral, uh, fewer alkaline components extracted. Um, it also differs in intensity. In some places it can be you know, more uh, concentrated or the flakes could be sparser. Uh, but so it suggests that there are points of stress and the crystalline is not just caused by uniform collapse of the weathered layer or just the tension between the surface and the parent glass, but also the internal structure differences within the layer itself. Um, it usually starts from edges or the points of physical stress, so radiating inwards. So other scholars like Stephen Kube already drew attention to that, that crystalline can begin sooner where glasses were cut or ground. And even very, very, very thin hydrated layers can crystal and flake off. So both of these pieces were exposed to the uh, alkali solution for just three hours and developed a wetted layer just a few micrometers thick, which nonetheless crystalled within just a day. Um, again, quick rundown of the most popular uh, methods of accelerate corrosion in water. Um, we're tested for both the M1 and M1.0 glasses. And most interesting results came after as, you know, as long as 300 days, so about a part of the year. In general, uh, in both exposure in liquid water and near 100% humidity in the sealed container, the M1.0 suffered much more, uh, developed thicker corrosion layers, stratification of its hydrated layer, which is very rarely seen in accelerated corrosion. and very commonly seen in uh, archaeological pieces. However, this was unfortunately deemed to be uh, too slow, uh, yet still a very interesting feature venue to explore, especially to recreate those uh, sort of laminated multi-layer uh, structures. One of the most interesting findings were crystalline in real time it happened during exposure to a strong microscope lights on uh, one of the pieces exposed to water, um, where you know, this action of spot heating with the lamp was enough to set off a chain reaction where the surface dried and ruptured under the stress in a single location, and then the cracks spread through uh, the entire glass within a mere two minutes. So you can see this reaction real time with some cracks appear almost instantaneously and some sort of creep along the surface. So it demonstrates it could be rationalized Crystalline could be rationalized as an event or a series of sudden events rather than simply uh, a long process. Uh, well, we've tried out this technique, but unfortunately, probably again during the interest of time, I'll quickly just say that it requires a lot of further work because of uh, technicalities of acoustics. Um, crystalline, as any cracking, creates acoustic waves that could theoretically be detected by an acoustic emission detector. So you could see crystalline in real time, passively. Uh, and it's been tested on wood and works well on enamels. However, on glass, um, I would say that it, you know, partially because of COVID, I wasn't able to uh, 
achieve consistent successes with this, but there are glimpses of the fact that it, it could work. Um, so if you want to discuss that, feel free to, to message me, let me an email. So in conclusion, uh, let's just say some partial conclusions for now. Uh, this, I'll start from quite banal and necessary point that although there are general trends that can be seen that the processes of glass corrosion are highly individualized, uh, the object's appearance upon excavation and further reactions to the environment is strongly dependent on even small variations in chemical composition, history of exposure, size, physical defects, and so on. So it's very important to use as much information about the objects as possible. Um, weakly alkaline solutions are preferred for pre-corrosion. Um, Roman glasses show a very strong resistance. Um, However, modern medieval glasses are very easily corroded uh, with weak uh, sodium bicarbonate solutions. Uh, it's also very likely at almost all early high alkali, especially potash glass that's excavated, is crystal because both humid and dry conditions can uh, set it through in different mechanisms. And pre existing stresses can uh, set up the chain reaction more easily. It seems very ubiquitous crystalline in these glasses. Though I struggle to find any uncrystalled uh, archaeological glasses throughout uh, my study that were made of this vulnerable composition. It can also occur in extremely thin layers, so may not always be symptomatic of deep corrosion, which could be encouraging to conservators, meaning that the crystalline and flaking may not always result in this um, in this considerable loss of uh, its scientific and artistic value of the piece. And we should reduce physical disturbance to minimize the lamination because it could be as important as tailoring storage conditions. Um, so currently uh, my plans is, are to pre-corrode the glass, uh, leave it in set conditions between 30 and 40, 30 and 60% RH in steps of 5% and track their weight, track their delamination uh, to see which conditions would be optimally responding to these pieces. Uh, I also use a dynamic vapor absorption uh, machine that is, is, in essence, it's a very fine, uh, very sensitive balance within a very precise environmental chamber uh, that um, would help us understand how these glasses respond to fluctuating humidities in terms of their weight. So how much water can they absorb, how quickly they absorb it, and when, what is the threshold for their grizzling? And the most successful experiments are planned to repeat with real archaeological glass uh, post medieval origin. Well, thank you all very much. Uh, sorry, that was a bit uh, long. Uh, got a particularly bad uh, bout of hay fever. So sorry if it sounded like I was talking from a, inside a closet. But thank you very much then. I hope you have some questions at the end of the session. Thanks, Antanas. And yeah, I think we should take questions at the end, isn't it? Um, I think you're you're back to being the chair if I don't moderate questions now. Yes. We've got our professional speaker, uh, third speaker of the session, uh, Dr. Paola Ricciardi, who's uh, a senior research scientist in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. I'm very pleased to welcome her to speak a little bit about herself, about how she got where she is, uh, what she does, and uh, maybe, uh, Dan, you can feel free to ask her for any advice that you would have. And of course, there's millions of ways to um, to advance in, in this career. Uh, Les would have to would love to hear um, and meet our uh, fellow heritage scientist, Paula. So, and without further ado, thanks, Santana. Thanks, Santana. Um, it's really nice to be here. It's slightly. Um, strange to be the professional speaker I think you know we're all professionals in this room different stages in our career um so I'm gonna I'm gonna speak very briefly I hope um not really gonna talk about science very much I thought it might be 
just interesting to tell a story um to, just to to talk a little bit about one way to get to do this job uh which is the way um that i've happened to find but i really love to have questions um at any point during my chat or even or later obviously um yeah about the science if you want to but also about any other tips from you know where do you find jobs to how do you write a cv anything um that i can help with i'm gonna try and share my screen i do have a few slides i thought um pictures are always a good thing um here we go so hopefully you can see my screen joseph nod if you can good thank you <laughs> So I get the feedback. Um, so my official title is Senior Research Scientist at the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge. I'm um, unofficially known as the zookeeper at the Fitz because our previous director called one of our instruments, our XREF spectrometer, called it the XREF monster from monsters to animals. It's a short you know, way. So I keep the analytical zoo at the Fitzwilliam. Um, and for anybody who might know, be familiar with the FITS. The FITS is the largest of the eight museums at the University of Cambridge and also the lead partner in the University of Cambridge Museums and Botanic Garden Consortium, so UCM as we call it. The UCM are, um, as I said, a consortium and they're a national portfolio organization partly funded by Arts Council England and so the FITS has the leading role within, um, within the consortium mainly because of its size. We have half a million objects. Um, we've just, we're just over 200 years old. We're funded in um, 1816. So recently celebrated our bicentenary. Um, so I'm the senior research scientist at the FITS and I'm also co-lead of CHERISH, which um, stands for the Cambridge Heritage Science Hub project, which we started in 2020 in collaboration with other departments within the university. Um, so the FITS with the Hamilton Carr Institute, which is the Fitzwilliams um, Paintings Conservation Department, but also teaches paintings conservation as part of the university um, offer. And then the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, the Department of Archaeology and the University Library. So we set up a consortium um, basically of colleagues who knew each other and were all interested in heritage and archaeological science and we thought let's join forces because <laughs> we can do more together than we can on our own. Um, so we set up this consortium which was actually fortunate enough to um, be awarded three million pounds from the capability for collections um, funding that AHRC put out um, in 2020. So we've spent the past sort of year and a bit um, refurbishing our labs and upgrading our facilities. Um, so there's a lot of momentum around heritage and archaeological science at the moment in Cambridge. Um, to go back a little bit, sorry about the grainy photo, that was the best I could do. Um, I'm afraid that shows just how old I am, <laughs> if that's the best photo I could find. Um, I didn't start studying when, you know, I didn't start my um, career when I was that old, but I have been wanting to do something with ancient history and objects since I was about six year old. Um, I really, really, really wanted to be an archaeologist when I was little and that someone told me that I'd have to learn Greek to, for that and I thought that was too hard. And so I studied physics instead. Not sure that was any easier, to be honest, but um, it ended up being a good choice. So I did. I ended up getting an undergraduate, well, a degree, an Italian degree, which we call undergraduate, but it's kind of equivalent to a BSc and Masters, really, in physics at the University of Rome. Um, and then after that, I did a one year master's in science for the conservation of cultural, cultural heritage at the University of Bologna although I was actually based in Faenza, which is a little town in Emilia Romagna. Um, and you might have heard of it because that's where Faience was born, pretty much. That Faience comes from Faenza, the term comes from that. So it's a, it's a place where lots of ceramics are made, you know, have been made for centuries as a museum of ceramics. And there's a research institute that works on ceramics. So that's where I did my master's. And then my, my PhD also in science for the conservation of culture and heritage, officially at University of Florence, but it was an unfunded PhD. And um, the, the research institute in Faenza decided they wanted to keep me, so they part funded it. So I remained there to do, actually do my research and only attended classes in Florence. Um, I did most of my work, in fact, in Faenza. Um, 
what I, um, I guess a bit of details about these various things. I did jump around places a bit, but I also jumped around in terms of the materials I was looking at quite a bit. Um, and I was slightly horrified to find these two pictures, which are from my, I think, first publication, uh, which is based on my undergraduate thesis, which was on portable extra spectroscopy for ancient metals. Um, the picture on the bottom left looked like I was working in the 1850s as far as computers are concerned, and that scares me very much. But basically, I spent about a year and a bit trying to um, optimize a homemade XRF, portable XRF system to analyze metals. I was um, <laughs> studying uh, measurement errors, basically, uh, lots of statistics, lots of statistical analysis. Um, but for my master's then, actually, and my PhD, I worked on ceramics. Did some XRF, but mostly ramen on ceramics, porcelain and glass. So changed completely, um, went from XRF on metals to a bunch of other techniques on different materials, um, which was fine. Um, and then after my PhD, or in fact, during my PhD, I spent quite a bit of time in Paris um, as part of an, again, the PhD wasn't funded, so I was looking for funds and found a way to fund a, a seven month stint in a lab in Paris, uh, part of the National Research Council of France that was also looking at um, ceramics and glass. So I did part of my work there. And then I went back after I'd finished my PhD um, for a couple of months contracts. Um, and then I was really lucky because I, um, I got a fellowship in imaging science at NGA in Washington. And once again, um, I changed materials, I changed the techniques I was using. Um, they didn't even have a Raman spectrometer. They had an amazing, they have an amazing science lab, you know, with 13 staff, uh, but no Raman and very little work on ceramics. So um, I again, instead, oh, sorry, I forgot about this picture. This is just to show you the kind of place I was working in when I was doing my, um, my PhD in, in um, Paris. That's a Raman spectrometer. Um, yeah, and a massive, I hope you can see, there's a little bit, um, there's a porcelain vase right there, but that was the kind of place I was working um, at the time, whereas this is working um, with NGA staff, actually, this is in Florence, we traveled quite a bit, because there I was working in imaging science, so doing lots of imaging, uh, and mostly on paintings from I've, I've done Leonardo da Vinci and I've done Rothko, so a little bit of everything really, um, but mostly my, my focus during those three years were um, medieval manuscripts. So I was basically, when I arrived um, as a fellow, the NGA has a really good fellowship program for um, conservation and, and science, and they have, um, as a fellow, you have to, to, to select a project for your three years there. Um, and as I, I was shopping for projects a little bit and the curator of manuscripts was about to retire. Um, but she said, nobody's working on manuscripts, you should do it. And I thought, okay, yeah, I could do that. Um, and so we set up this project initially trying to compare manuscript painting. So painting illumination on manuscripts with panel painting by the same artist. So um, NGA had one panel painting and two manuscript fragments by the same Italian Renaissance artist Lorenzo Monaco. The idea was to do a full comprehensive technical study on, on all these three objects and see how we could compare the technique that he, the same person used on panel and on manuscripts. And they were actually more, um, they had more things in common that we thought he was actually using egg tempera on manuscripts, which was um, something nobody had ever really been able to prove. So we managed to prove that scientifically, which was, um, was quite interesting. Um, and then after three years in the US, I was drawn to Cambridge, um, which is quite an interesting place. Um, and so first for five years, if I should say, sorry, I came to Cambridge on a one year contract in 2011, and I'm still here. <laughs> so, you know, things like this happen, you know, it was one year and then another year and then three years and then another five. And then it's, um, about a year and a half ago, it became a permanent contract. Um, so I came thinking I'd spend one year looking at medieval manuscripts. Um, I spent five years looking at medieval manuscripts, doing a lot of research in the Department of Manuscripts and Printed Books, which um, 
led to an exhibition. Actually, I was very involved in the setup of the, the exhibition. I co-authored the catalog. Um, we had an international conference uh, during the exhibition, so co um, co-edited the proceedings for that. Um, so it was really interesting, I guess, to be part of the museum life, just not just the research. You know, I managed to um, do other things that sometimes heritage scientists. Well, we don't always get to do, I guess, if we're not embedded in the life of a museum or culture and institution. Um, so it was, it was really nice to be able to do other things. Um, and then in, um, oh yeah, manuscripts, sorry. Just to say, it wasn't just manuscripts. So that was my core job. Um, but of course, when you have half a million objects in the collections, you start looking at other things as well. And there's a big project going on here on coffins, Egyptian coffins. So we um, we did have coffins in the lab sometimes, trap them to a lead shield um, and extract them as well. And the empty space that is not because I had um, any uh, free time, but because a large part actually of my life during those four years um, was taken by this little chap. Um, I managed to have a baby one year after arriving Cambridge. Um, so, you know, took some adjusting um, to being a working mum as well as a, as, a, as a researcher. And then from 2017, um, I've been a research scientist for the whole museum. So not just manuscripts and printed books. Um, first research scientist, now senior research scientist. That just means I'm older, I think. Um, and again, I've had a chance to work on all sorts of different kinds of objects, a few paintings, though not too many, um, quite a lot of books, both manuscripts and printed books. So the book you see there on the left, it's actually a printed book, but it's hand painted. It's a presentation copy of the Great Bible of Henry VIII, which belonged either to Henry VIII or to Thomas Cromwell, we're not entirely sure. Um, but that's a collaboration with St. John's College in Cambridge and Queen Mary University in London, where we've, we think we've identified the um, last known portrait of Cromwell before he was um, beheaded. Um, and then I've done quite a lot of work on portrait miniatures, so I like things that are small. Um, portrait miniatures are kind of the evolution of manuscripts, especially in England, um, and you see one of them in, in the middle of the page that with an infrared image showing the workings, the way the artist changed actually his mind quite a bit about the way the color should sit. Um, and there's an interesting conversation going on at the moment with my um, co-researchers on that study about when that change happened and whether the sitter himself, Ludovic Stewart, who's represented in the portrait, might have had anything to do with the change. Um, I worked on a few jewels. We have a nice collection of sort of late 19, early 20th century jewels. Um, in which the gemstones have never been identified analytically. So some of them are records are wrong. Um, so before they went on, on show, they asked me to check that our, all the rubies and emeralds were actually rubies and emeralds. Not all of them were. Um, and I had another chance to work on an exhibition inspired, which was actually really nice because it was, um, it was an exhibition of just one painting from the Fitz um, with the addition of lots of works of art made by primary school children in Cambridge inspired by the painting um, and so we did some analysis because the children wanted to know what the artist had used to um, to paint his um, scene with Cupid and Psyche. Um, that's it for me, um, that was short and hopefully sweet uh, but I'm really happy to yeah to take questions or go more in detail into um, any of this. That was fantastic, Paula. Thank you very much. What a kaleidoscope of works, events, travel. Yes. Well, sometimes you have no direction and it's a great direction, you know. I couldn't have planned it, to be honest. <laughs> great. That's very encouraging to all of us. There's a lot of paths to choose from. Fantastic. Well, uh, now we've heard all the talks. Uh, we'll be happy to hear you talk. Uh, you can feel free to ask any questions to any of the speakers by text or uh, by voice. Uh, so please go ahead. Um, <coughs> I believe we, we had a question in the chat. 
um, for from Paola to a bet. Uh, we could start <laughs> with with this one while we wait for others to accumulate. Yeah, yeah I saw the question, and at MoMA we mainly used XRF and some imaging techniques. We did UVF, some um, reflectography. We did X-rays just by the virtue of doing non-invasive analysis. At the Menil collection, they I think had a higher motivation for sampling because they did have some rare falsies in their collection, and they wanted to make sure that the ones, the remaining ones, were not <laughs> rare falsy or forgeries. And so they, they did end up sampling into the cross section from those works, which, which was great because it greatly enriched our work and kind of provided an, an you know, micro invasive confirmation of some of the things that we found, you know, non-invasively using XRF, which can be a bit of an academic guessing game at times. Yeah, that's what I was, because I, I thought a couple of your, you know, the question about the chromium oxide green, you know, there are non-invasive ways potentially to distinguish yeah. between that and viridian. And also yeah. the manganese can be tricky sometimes. I think we have found it once as a manganese black, so manganese oxide. It's not mm -hmm. very widely used, but it does exist. And so sometimes yeah. it's like... You know, we're we're all assuming that manganese means amber, and myself included. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sometimes you get caught out. Um, yes. You know, yeah. so it, yeah, it'd be great to see some maybe some other techniques brought in so you can refine your um, identifications. Yes, and I will say with the with the chrome green with the Prussian blue, I maybe I should have put that in there. But when we did infrared, we were able to see the absorbance of the fresh blue in that so that definitely helped in confirming it non-invasively yeah so there are little tricks here and there to kind of go around the the sampling which is my favorite thing to do but it's not always the conservator's favorite thing to do <laughs> okay thank you uh we've have a question from Antonella Balerna. Uh, I think that's as opposed to Paola. So do you think that staying in Italy, you could have the same kind of career? That's a really good happens. question. Yeah, and it's it's a bit of a tough one to answer, I think. I think um, same kind, potentially. The main difference, as far as I can tell, is that in Italy, the figure of a heritage scientist is not usually a figure that exists in museums. So as far as I know, it's only really the Vatican museums who have scientists on site. And then the closer you get to that is I think the Opifici in Florence, who works for the Florentine Museum. So you do get, um, I guess, a closer relationship with the collections and with the people who care for the collections. But what I realized very much um, as soon as I got to NGA, which was my first experience in a museum, was that I, I just like being in the museum, in the collection, because it gives me the possibility to um, talk on a daily basis with the curators and the conservators who are working on the collections. It, it really enhances and improves the research questions I can ask. I mean, most of my questions actually come from the curators. I don't do a lot of conservation science. So it's not usually the conservators who come and ask me about, you know, maybe how to best preserve something. It's a lot of curatorial, so technical art history question, contextual questions. We do a lot of work on like large scale, you know, large numbers of say manuscripts to identify trends and to link those to, you know, trade in materials, for example, or whether an artist was traveling or not traveling and where he was working and who he was working with and what's the workshop practice. So there are lots of questions that are not very scientific at the base of the work I do and I really like that and then of course because you're in the collection um if you realize so I'll give you an example that relates to XREF and assuming things um I was asked when I only just or I think in 2014 to make sure that the white in a manuscript was lead white because it had made black stains on the facing page so we are assuming it's lead white it's degraded and I go and I do XRF on it and there's quite a lot of lead and there's some mercury and I'm like there's no red here you know you look underneath another million that I can see but strange make a note odd amount of mercury um that was it six years later I'm analyzing a portrait miniature white lace lots of barium clearly retouching no lead whatsoever quite a bit of mercury 
guess what? Ends up in white in that miniature, the original one, which degraded and therefore was overpainted with barium white, is calomel, mercury chloride. Very unusual pigment. The pigment compendium doesn't have it. That's my Bible. You can't not have a pigment in that. Um, anyway, you realize it actually does turn up in some treatises. I go back to the manuscript and guess what? That was calomel too. Um, and this is just to say, because I'm in the collection, I can go back to the box or the manuscript set, pick it up again as like, you know, I forgot to do this. Or <laughs> Let's double check this result six years later. Um, and it's really nice to be able to get that access to the collection. Um, and that, it just, Italy is just not set up like that. It's, you know, it's the UK and the US mostly were set up like that. Um, I hope that's a good answer. I have one question um, for you as well, Paola. In, in fact, I also have one technical one for Antana Salas like this. But I wanted to ask you about the, um, how to put this. How could you comment on when you've moved from one position to the other? Has it ever been a struggle to move beyond the comfort zone of the techniques you know very well, the ones you learn? in your studies you know, before starting to work? Because I, at least it was for me when I finished my PhD, I only felt comfortable with one very specific technique and all the jobs I looked for were on very adjacent areas. And now with some perspective, I think it's easier than what it seems to um, try to reach beyond your core expertise in, in, in our field. Have you had any experience of this? That's a good question. Um, I think I did think about that quite a bit when I moved to Washington in particular. Um, to be honest, I think I was quite desperate because I'd finished my PhD. I really needed this job, applied for loads of jobs, couldn't get anything. Um, I wasn't particularly keen on moving to the US either, to be honest. I, you know, we were in Paris, it's nice. Um, and then I. I really, really wanted to do this kind of job, basically. That was a chance that they gave. I mean, they weren't very keen on hiring me either because, I, I, seriously, I've had this conversation later with John Delaney, who was my boss there, and, you know, I'm good, very good friends with him. But initially, it was like, why should I get her? She knows nothing about imaging, nothing about paintings. Um, and so I'm grateful, actually, that they were, they were, you know, they, they took a chance in a way. And I think, but I think, I actually think that's really important for early career researchers and, and to know that we scientists and heritage scientists have so many transferable skills that we have no idea we have, I think. I always say, and I remember nothing about my physics training. Ask me the most basic physics law. I don't know what it is, but physics taught me how to think and how to study and how to get the information I need. And I think that that's what matters really. And you have to be curious as well. Um, and also I think the struggle might be if it's a really short position, that's a struggle. So I, what I think what made a difference for me was that, um, so for example, for my master's, it was only a short project, but then I had three years of PhD to really refine my knowledge of ceramics and Raman spectroscopy. And the position in Washington was also three years. And I did spend the first year basically just getting to grips with techniques and shadowing, you know, the senior scientists. So being his lab hand in a way, you know, being doing the taking notes about the spectra and just carrying things around mostly not doing proper research. That's how I spent the first year. And then by the end of that, I was comfortable with using techniques I hadn't used before. And I was comfortable with looking at materials I'd not looked at before. Um, so I think I think that's what it is. Um, and yeah, but I think we need to be slightly bolder. I think we, we can do lots more than we give ourselves credit for. And I just want to kind of touch on that a little bit. I think, you know, I also came out of my PhD. I was trained as a Raman spectroscopist. I do Raman, I do Sears, that is my gig. But you quite often when you go into a training position, like a fellowship right outside of your, you know, right after your PhD, quite regularly, you're going to get thrown into learning all these different techniques, which I picked up in my time here at MoMA as a fellow. And so you will have a lot of opportunities to be able to pick up those techniques. And so I feel sometimes people will graduate and be like, oh, can I apply what I'm doing specific to the cultural heritage? 
But if you do go into a postdoc or a fellowship opportunity, you can bring those expertise with you because they're usually wanted and desired, but also at the same time, you will be able to pick up a lot of knowledge just being there. It can be intimidating, but I think, you know, your mentors will be able to you know, hold your hand and then let you lead. Yeah, and I think it's really worth not stopping and not applying, you know, not not applying for jobs just mm -hmm. because you've not done ceramics before. Um, you know, we, we again, we, we really tick more boxes than we think we do. Um, and I think, yeah, but we have to believe that we do. Yeah. yeah <laughs> In exactly. order to sell it to the people we're going to. And there, if they, again, the hiring panels, if they're, they're good, they know that, you know, people, if you're clever, you can learn you know so um my my technical question for antanas is about the chrysling but i think it has a dimension on career development as well uh, maybe that half is not for antanas to answer yet but uh, uh, perhaps well we'll see i have i find it very interesting first i'm curious scientifically what has not worked like you say, there are indications. And I think it's such a promising idea. And if it worked, you know, being able to correlate these measurements with atmospheric conditions or microenvironmental conditions will lead so many interesting results. I'm very curious to see what do you think it's necessary to make this work? But I want to relate it to a broader concept of uh, perhaps a question to Paola and uh, Abed to be discussed later. Could you recall things that didn't work in your PhD area and that have served you later? Where do I start? <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. So at, if you were referring uh, for the first part of the question to acoustics, uh, that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, the acoustic monitoring of the crisis. Yes. So the problem with that was uh, you either said it's so sensitive that it picks up literally everything that's going on in the background and the files become so large they do not anymore fit on the storage of the machine and it stops in a day or it's not sensitive enough uh, to pick up these tiny tiny uh, cracks in the glass body so and of course covid has changed many things i could not access some technical help from people who are more experienced in this technique unfortunately so i sort of just sort of had to poke around and try different things myself uh, but it's worked on enamels, uh, it's been demonstrated, and I think it can work, it just needs uh, maybe someone with more uh, technical knowledge or someone more centered on this technique as their, uh, their main topic, or has used it before. Uh, but there's already a baseline that I've, I've managed to make is that we've shown that you can create an accelerated corrosion method that would not crystal the glass, and you could sort of do it yourself at your own uh, at your own desire, at your own time frame. So you could visually see it cracking after a day, uh, which is which is great because it, it it's a very fine balance. And in general, with yeah, experimental failures, so many. Well, it wouldn't call, even call them failures. You know, yes, in a way, they did not work for me. They were results. They just not, they were just not the results that I needed for this very specific topic, and this does not at all mean that I will not uh, say include them in my thesis or not talk about them extensively because they're they will be still very important to someone, or even myself later. Who knows? Uh, so yes, don't be afraid of uh, you know trying something. If it's not what you want, it's already a step in the right direction. And you don't necessarily need to throw the whole thing out. You can just uh, tweak it because so many variables influence this that you might not even know what's going. What, what is what is the thing that that um, creates the result that you uh, did not expect? And I will say, you know, conservators are a little better about this because they will have like mistake sessions. Or Sorry, have... I don't know if it's my. Can you hear me? Speakers? Uh, yeah. Better. Okay. So I don't know, like with conservatives, they will have like mistake sessions or they will talk about where things don't work or if a treatment was not appropriate. 
scientists are a little bit averse to doing that because I think they might feel like that shows them to not be good scientists or not know the right techniques. But I think we could learn from each other quite regularly about the things that don't work as much as the things that don't work. Like, you know, my PhD, I remember there was a postdoc said that basically was like, in America, PhD is five years. He's like, the first three years is just trying things that don't work because that is regularly what happens. You try something, it doesn't work, you try something else. And so to kind of, to, to know that and to inherently know that that is a part of the scientific method and know that that is part of research is it lifts a lot of burden off your shoulders to feel like you're, not that you're failing, but you're just trying different things. And usually one of them will stick at the end of the day. just seen there's a question in the chat um are you happy for me to answer that yeah yeah go ahead um so this is about having children having a break going back um it's a very 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 good question i'm not sure of the best i'm not a great example from this point of view i think in the sense that um i found it very hard to not work during my maternity leave and only took about six or seven months which was nowhere near enough. Um, you can take up to a year here in the UK. Um, so I was, um, I really struggled not being at work because work had been, uh, you know, been my, had been me for a really long time. Um, so I only had a short break really, came back, got completely immersed in work and it took me a while to recognize that actually I needed to have a little bit more balance. So it was actually, so when my son started going to school, so not necessarily anymore, but school. So when he was five, I went, I decreased my hours from 37 to 33 a week, which is not, you know, not massive, but it allows me to pick him up from school twice a week. Cause I realized that I didn't know any of his nursery teachers because his dad would drop him off in the morning and I would pick him up from a childminder at the end of the day. So I didn't know anybody at the nursery, his friends, his, you know, friends, moms, teachers so I thought okay starting school we're starting over so I do pick him up you know twice twice a week now and um and I'm still very seriously considering um going down to part-time to four days a week full stop in order to to manage and I think if I were just starting my role now I would just say I, I work four days a week um it's slightly harder to go down in at in time when you're already working because your workload is not going to go down <laughs> no matter how much they promise <laughs> you're still going to be required to do everything you already do unless you go you know three days a week um so yeah it's not it's not easy but I think at least in the UK here I think employers are getting much better at acknowledging the need for flexible working and part-time and lots of people you know lots of roles they're advertised as full-time but flexible working patterns will be considered at least here in the university we tend to do that as standard pretty much um you know you, sometimes you can offer a job share you know you can say actually i'll do this two days a week and my friend's going to do it through you know you, you can even interview together in some cases um and even if it's not offered the flexible working or part-time I would always argue apply for the job first and then if you get to the interview say look I'd really love to do this but I've got a kid for whatever reason I'd like to work four days a week for my mental health for whatever you know you don't have to tell them why um can we make this work is there any are there any tasks in this job description that maybe you, you can hire an admin to do or you can give to you know hire a part-time technician to do um so don't let that stop you don't have to work full-time you don't have to work 80 hours a week to do this job it's hard um and I think and again I sound really wise and old here but actually this is very new knowledge for me as well because obviously during COVID it was all hybrid and so we my laptop was always on 8 a.m to midnight um and I now don't do that anymore I did I do sometimes I actually leave it at work um, <laughs> just scary, but it happens. Um, I've got, I've no longer got my work email on my phone. Um, I think you need to, to set those boundaries. And, and if you manage to do that, it can be done. And I think, um, look for an employer that's respectful of that and supportive of that, and you'll work better. 
I give a lot more when I do the only the hours I'm supposed to be doing. Sorry, that was a really long answer. Thank you, Paula. I'm getting a, so many questions today. This is great. Um, would anyone else like to maybe ask uh, Beds, Paula, or me a question? Feel free to raise your hand and speak also uh, with video. I, I I don't have a question, but I I would like to to say a few words to wrap up if that's okay, Antanas. Um, since we are the last four minutes, and but if a question comes comes up, um, maybe we can squeeze it in anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's just that I I wanted to to say that. We are very glad that we've managed to organize this and so many people have signed up. It's something that since we started uh, asking the views of early career researchers on what the field needed a year ago, it's something we've wanted to do. And we have now planned monthly sessions for the next four months or so. But we would like this to be not something that has a fixed format um, that it's just suggested by ICON and NHSF. We would like this to be something that responds to what people want to discuss about. Our first four talks are like a first iteration, I think. But if anyone wants to come with suggestions of what they would like to speak about, research in progress about which you want to get feedback from the heritage science community, or perhaps topics of interest to researchers that are seldom discussed in open forums, like difficulties in publishing in technical journals outside of the heritage sector or uh, funding development, just email us and, and, and Tennis, Caroline or myself, and we will organize sessions in response to this. If you have published a paper and want a forum to discuss it, that's also the place to do it. So we are very open to your, your suggestions and we'll implement them in the next uh, sessions. Hopefully, when we get to the end of the four we have planned, we will already have enough suggestions from you to, to go on. And, and yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you, and a huge thank you to Antanas particularly for uh, joining together this programme, an amazing job. Uh, not only presenting, um, speaking, and but also encouraging everyone to take part in this. So, thank you very much. And and as he said, we'll we'll share information um, as as soon as we've got it all live through the channels that we used previously. And um, we'd love to hear your feedback, as Josep said. Um, and let's hope that we can yeah develop this into a really um, great series. So, thank you everyone for taking part. <laughs>